Hey, this is Brother Justin, First Baptist Church Mesquite, and I'm bringing to you today a uh, content-oriented lesson from our Sunday school we did yesterday, meaning um, during Sunday school we have lots of interaction and question and answer and comments and things like that. Um, and I don't want to record that because I don't want people being afraid to, to speak up in class and to share. Um, so instead, on Mondays or Tuesdays, I'm going to try to present the material from Sunday school class for those who weren't able to, to attend on Sunday. So for those who want to uh, stay in touch with the Sunday school class uh, or keep up with the material, they'll be able to do so. So let's dive right into their study. Basically for two weeks while I'm here, I'm gonna be doing um, a couple lessons uh, on the call of Moses called I Have Come Down to Deliver. It's from Exodus 3 to Exodus 4, verse 17. Uh, a study on the call of Moses, just a couple Sundays to uh, fill the space while I'm here. Uh, more than fill the space, I'm, I'm sharing the Word of God. But um, then on the 28th, there's going to be a little get-together for in honor of Doug. And then back when I get started again, second time, uh, Sunday School 2.0 will begin July 5th, I, I believe, is the calendar date. And I have some special plans for them. Um, but today we're doing the call of Moses. So if you're not already there, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. My girls uh, have liked all of the Tinkerbell movies that Disney has produced. And Tinkerbell in those movies is a tinkerer. That means she likes to find lost things and she likes to fix broken things. And so there's a few scenes where she's flying along the beach or in the woods or whatever, and she sees something that's cast aside and she has the ability to look at it and think, well, I can, I can do something with that. I can use that. I can make that a useful tool for, for what I want to do. And, uh, and so she does. She builds things out of lost things, broken things, so that they become valuable. And really, that's what God does to us, and that's what God does in the life of Moses. So what's the context of this passage? The people, people of Israel have been enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 or so years, and Moses comes along, and you probably know the story of Moses or part of the story of Moses. Basically, he grew up as an Egyptian prince in the royal household, but he became a fugitive when he killed a fellow Egyptian as he was trying to defend uh, a Hebrew, one of his ethnic race. Uh, and so after that, he fled to Midian, met a man named Jethro, settled down as a shepherd, and married one of Jethro's daughters. So pick up the story in Exodus chapter 3, Verses 1 through 3. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight why the bush is not burned. First imperative I have for you is this, to hear God's calling. Hear God's calling. Um, unfortunately for us, we typically don't have a burning bush to give us the calling of God on our lives. The calling of God on our lives is often more subtle than that. But we'll talk about that in a moment. So Moses is tending his flock near Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, and he sees this burning bush and he goes to check it out. And why wouldn't you? This is a bush that's on fire that is not being consumed. 
And so he goes to check it out. And from that, he hears the voice of God, Moses, Moses. And he answered, here I am. Great response uh, for anyone who hears God's call on their life for anything big or small. Here I am, Lord. And uh, but you don't get a clearer call from from God than that. Now, things for Moses hadn't turned out the best. Back in Egypt, when he tried to intervene to prevent the abuse of a Hebrew slave, it backfired. Um, basically, he ended up killing the guy and hit it, and but he, it was exposed. And he had ended up worse off. So he was no longer a prince of Egypt, but neither was he seen as a Hebrew um, a hero among, among the Hebrews. He was basically a fugitive nobody watching sheep in the wilderness. And it wasn't when he was a prince that God called him, when he had everything going for him. It was in that situation of shepherding, one of the lowest of the low uh, jobs in the ancient world. It was in that position that God called Moses. Now, I don't know where you are in your life today. Um, maybe your life couldn't be better. Fantastic. It's wonderful. Um, happy, healthy, rich, and pretty. If that's the case, well, God, God bless you. Celebrate it. Live life to the full. Um, but if you're like me, and like most people, your life is probably a mixture of struggles and blessings. Sometimes it gets even more complicated than that. So wherever you find yourself today, whether you're a prince, whether you're a shepherd in your stage of life, I encourage you to hear the call of God, listen to the call of God. And what are some ways that he might speak to us? How might he speak to us? Um, well, let's, let's think about that. In Sunday school class, we talked about some of those ways, and maybe you could jot some of these ideas down to listen for God speaking to you. Uh, we talked about things like personal conviction and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the Word of God speaking to us, uh, how God can use a good sermon, uh, the pastor's message, uh, a godly invitation or interest, an opportunity, um, situations, providence, what we call providence, opportunities in front of us and uh, in our life. And all of these things can are ways that God can use to call us to a ministry, a specific uh, path or mission or purpose um, in our lives. But no matter what that is, you can take comfort and strength in this truth. I want you to look at verse 7. Of course, we didn't read to verse 7. Let me read to verse 7. When the Lord saw that he turned aside, this is verse 4, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, watch this. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, and I know their sufferings. Beautiful truth. God sees, God hears, and God knows everything about your situation. And the Lord says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. He knows what you're going through. He sees exactly where you are. He hears your heart. He knows your struggles. So take comfort from that today. He knows our situation just like he knows the Hebrew situation in slavery. You also need to trust that God has a plan. Trust that God has a plan. 
and that's in verse 8. And look at all the details in verse 8. What's God say? Yahweh, the Lord, says, I have come down to deliver them. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and the Overbites, and the Helgamites, and the Termites, and the Stalagmites, all those ites. But uh, seriously, though, God has a specific plan for his people. And God has a plan for us individually, for the life of our church, for your family situation. And although you might not be able to see it, you need to learn to trust God. Because the truth is, God's not winging it. God doesn't shoot from the hip. Uh, he has a detailed plan for you and me. I love it here that God doesn't say, "Ah, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help. Just a vague promise of help. Although sometimes he does that. I'm here for you. But he has a specific plan. Look at all those details in verse 8. I'm coming down. And I'm going to rescue you. And I'm going to take you out of the land of Egypt. And I'm going to put you into a good and prosperous land. And look at all these map points that I'm talking about. This people and that people and those ites and this ites. Why would he list all those? Because there is a specific plan that God was going to use. And each of those areas, God was going to give to a tribe. And so, beautiful detailed plan. Let's take a detour real quick to Jeremiah chapter 29, a passage you probably know very well. Uh, and uh, the people of God are in exile, just like pastor's been reading in uh, the book of Daniel. Je uh, Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14 says this. Listen to this promise. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the people's from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Jeremiah 29. Uh, great passage. Um, missed some action there. Uh, all those passages we see, the Lord being very active. I have come down to deliver you, and I am going to fulfill the plans I have for you. I know the plans that I have for you, plans of good and not evil. Now, we know that that was for, in that context, the people of God, Israel, as they were in exile. So the context is very rich there. How much more, then, can we say that for the New Testament Israel, the church of God, that God has a specific deliverance salvation plan for us that he is bringing about in our lives. Uh, I know the plans I have for you. But here's the exciting and intimidating part. Whoop, back up. Um, you and I have a part to play in this divine drama. Verse 10, he says, come, I will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Whoa, slow down there, God. Oh, put on the brakes. Beep, beep, beep. I was all down with this plan until you said, I have something to do in this plan. Um, well, that's the beautiful part about it. God doesn't have to use us. He doesn't need to use us, and yet he chooses to involve us in his 
salvation plan to the world through the gospel. And uh, Moses is going to throw up all kinds of objections. Um, but here's the consistent pattern of the whole Bible. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. You think about that. Think about all the that uh, God has used in the Bible. Am I still recording? Ah, there I am. You got to love technology. Okay, so let's list some average guy Bible characters, average guy and average girl uh, Bible characters that got used in ordinary ways, or extraordinary ways. We think about Joseph, that youngest brother, a castaway slave, Egyptian prisoner, who God rose to the second in command over all of Egypt to save not only his people, but Egypt too. Think of Gideon, the teenager, the least of his clan. God used him to liberate his fellow Hebrews, um, 300 in fact. Think about David, that young, young man with the wrist rocket who took down the mightiest uh, soldier in ancient history, Goliath. You know, we could mention Esther. Daniel, how we're reading and studying about Daniel during Sunday worship, Nehemiah, or even Mary, the mother of Jesus. Think about even the Apostle Peter. It wasn't necessarily pedigree preacher material. He was just a fisherman. Even Paul, who uh, had a rich education and a strong Hebrew pedigree, God used in extraordinary ways, but he had to break him down first and humble them. Um, the Bible is thick with normal sinners, sometimes even dysfunctional sinners, whom God uses to uh, do his work. So God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Why would God do that? Why not use already gifted, qualified? Wouldn't it be easier just to, to use people who were uh, already had all the skills and assets and talents and abilities. Why would he do that? Well, because when God uses the least of these to do great things, the glory belongs to him and him alone. Nobody else can take the glory when they see uh, a humble, simple person doing extraordinary things for God. And that's the pattern throughout the whole Bible, it seems to me. There's a few that had it going for them, a few kings and such like that. But by and large, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So it's during all this dull stuff of life, the shepherding of life, like Moses, that God calls us. And I think about that, you know, the voice of God, it doesn't always come during the couple's retreat or the, the, the super... Uh, hyped up conference. Uh, it's sometimes, oftentimes in the daily grind of life when you're shepherding, just like Moses, sometimes even at dark times, lowly times, that God calls you to a ministry or a service or a mission or purpose when he's got our attention. So take a time to pause and answer this rhetorical question, what might God be calling you to do? What area of service, if you aren't involved with something, uh, is, is he calling you to do? There is a supplemental verse in John 20, 21, that says, as I, as God sent me, this is the Mosier paraphrase, so I am sending you. He said that to the disciples. And he says it to us today. Disciples, 12 very ordinary men. And most of us are ordinary men. I like to think of it um, this way. If you've got a pulse, 
you've got a purpose. If you're alive, God has you alive for a reason, for a purpose. So what might God be calling you to do? And the truth is, sometimes our callings change in life um, from this to that. In fact, rarely, I think, does God just stop a calling and you're not supposed to do anything. I don't know that I've ever seen that. Usually you're called from one thing to another until he calls you home. But if you've got a pulse, you've got a purpose. What is God's purpose for you in your life? And are you listening and seeking after that purpose? So God sees, hears, and knows everything about your situation. Take comfort in that. God has a plan for deliverance. Take comfort in that. And God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So if you're an ordinary person like me, that's exciting news. That's good news. So listen for God's calling. And remember, those of us who are retired, those of us veterans of the faith, uh, those of us with years of experience, I've got to be very cautious there. Moses was 80 years old when he got the call of God. It wasn't when he was 40 when he was a prince. It was 40 years later that he heard the call of God. And hopefully, you know, none of us will be called to liberate a nation, although that would be exciting, and God certainly could do that. It's probably more along the lines of service, especially in the church, in the body of Christ. So where is God calling you? Second imperative, I would encourage you to pursue God's plan. Pursue God's plan. Let me read 11 through 20 here for us. And um, after this imperative, we'll stop for the day. So the Lord says, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, and he gives us a bad example to follow. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He balks. He said, the Lord said, but I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain, Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. And whose mighty hand is that going to be? The Lord's. So I will stretch out my hand, the Lord says, and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. Pursue God's plan. I'd encourage you to pursue God's plan for your life, that calling that he has for you. Identify it and pursue it. Don't drag your feet just like Moses. He gives us a bad example to follow, but Moses eventually figures it out, and he ends up being the pinnacle of Old Testament prophets, basically. But Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I? Have you ever asked that question? Who am I? You ever been there? Uh, who am I to uh, be a pastor, be a 
a Sunday school teacher? Who am I to serve in that ministry or to sing in the praise team or, or to do this or that? Uh, you know, we all have deep insecurities, just like Moses. It's kind of a reality check for us. If we're honest with ourselves, you know, we hide them very well. Um, but we need to admit the truth. We all have deep insecurities. Uh, look at all of Moses' objections. Verse 11, he says, who am I? I'm a nobody. I don't have the skills to do this. I don't have the family history. I don't have, um, I don't have money. I don't have uh, the skills. Who am I? Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, they're not going to listen to me, God. They won't believe me. Chapter 4, verse 10, I am slow of speech and tongue. I don't talk good enough. I don't talk good or enough. Chapter 4, verse 13, please send somebody else. God, you've just got the wrong guy. So this is Moses, and honestly, this is me sometimes. Sometimes I confess to you that I do the same thing. Who am I? I'm, I'm a nobody. And honestly, in the grand scheme of life, I'm not that important. Um, and that's okay, because I've learned that if God is not doing his work through me, my life will have no lasting significance. So it's not about me. It's about God. I can't change hearts. I can't grow faith. That's what God does. That's God's work. I need to be humble and obedient and trusting and follow. Um, but, you know, each of us needs to come to that place of humble confession, whatever it is that God has called you to be, whether that's some high and lofty position, at least that we think of, or, or whether it's a really low place of ministry or service in God's kingdom. None of it's unimportant. It's all important to God because it's serving God. He's the king, eternal. So it's all important. And you can't do it without God doing it through you. So it's okay to embrace that insecurity. We need to rest in our inabilities at time. And why would that be? Well, I put it this way. God likes to use our weakness to accomplish his great plans. Here to Moses, he says, I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt. Verse 20, I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. Look at all the first person pronouns in, in this passage. The Lord, Yahweh, talking. I will. I'm going to do. You know, it's interesting what God didn't tell Moses. He didn't say to Moses, you know, Moses, you're good enough. Cheer up, buddy. Uh, you got skills, bro. Um, you know, Moses, you're being too hard on yourself. You're selling yourself short. Uh, he doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to do it. Uh, Saturday Night Live used to do a little parody about self-help, and uh, it was this little mousy guy, Stuart Smalley, looking in the mirror, saying to himself, uh, trying to talk himself into going out and experiencing the world, you know, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. Well, it was a self-help parody. But the Bible's not a book for boosting self-esteem. It's a book for building God-esteem. And the real reality is, you and I are sinners. We're broken and weak and needy, and that's okay. That's good, because God uses people who are broken and needy uh, for his glory. Think about the Apostle Paul, who said in 2 Corinthians that God had given him a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. We don't know what it is. Um, he pleaded with God three times that God might take it away, and God said no. In 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10, you know these words, my grace, this is what God told Moses. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. It's enough. 
Um, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul went on to say, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And this is so counterintuitive and countercultural. I mean, who goes into a job interview and says, well, let me tell you how uh, all my weaknesses, let me tell you how, how, how much I stink. Uh, I would stink at this job. Uh, well, of course, we wouldn't do that. But the reality is it's healthy to acknowledge our weaknesses and to embrace them because God has a plan and he can use you and be glorified through your weaknesses. My grace is sufficient for you. So God has a plan, a detailed plan. And when he reveals part of that plan to you, and it's usually not all at once, like we see here with Moses, uh, Moses had it easy, man. Most of us, we have just a portion of the plan revealed uh, at a time as we un as each day unfolds. We just got to obey God for the step that we're on and trust him for the next step. But we know that just because he doesn't reveal it to us doesn't mean that he doesn't have a plan. He's got a plan. And that can be intimidating to us, knowing that God is unfolding his plan and he wants us to be a part of that plan and to pursue that plan. Individually and collectively, we have weaknesses. We have inabilities, we have insecurities. Paul says, don't hide them, embrace them. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God loves using our weaknesses to magnify his power in our lives and get the glory. Praise God. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about God and what he can do when we are an open and clean vessel for him to use us. Um, hear God's calling. Pursue God's plan. And then next week, we will along to imperative number three, trust God's presence. But for now, we're going to stop. And uh, let me close with a word of prayer. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this time. And it's been a time of instruction for you. I would encourage you to, if you feel comfortable and um, safe uh, because of the virus and all, uh, come to Sunday school so we can have more interaction. But this will at least you keep you up, keep you up to speed as far as our class goes. And I plan to do this weekly. So let's pause for a word of prayer and then we'll, I'll be dismissed. We'll be dismissed. I'm by myself. I will be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for the calling you have on our lives. And uh, thank you for the example of your calling on Moses's life and how you used this broken man to do extraordinary things. We want to submit, surrender ourselves to you that you would call us and use us no matter where we are and what we're doing to be sensitive to your call, to have our, hear, our ears open to your voice uh, and to respond like Moses. Here I am. Whatever it is you want me to do, reveal it to me and I will obey. Uh, bless our Sunday school class. Bless those watching uh, at home. Pray that they would be nourished and encouraged in their faith. And... Um, Till we all get back together again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Take care, guys.